towards that. And in the back as you walk in, hopefully you do see notes. They're there. I typically stay close-ish to those notes, and hopefully they'll be helpful for you. If you're online, you'll find them there. And so if you have a Bible this morning, go ahead and open up to the, the book of 1 John. And so we're going to be 1 John. We're in the first chapter. We're going to start with verse 4, excuse me, verse 5 today, and we're going to look at this section up to chapter 2, verse 2. So that's where we're looking to grab a Bible. And if you don't have one with you, you're in luck because right in front of you in the pew, there is a Bible there that you can open up to it. The book of 1 John is near the back, and I'm even going to tell you the page number that this, um, where we're turning, it's page 1054. So Pew Bible 1054 on your device or what have you, go ahead and open it up. So if you're with us, if you remember, we did a year-long series in the book of John. And that series concluded last March. And so we then went into Habakkuk, and then we spent this summer in Philippians. And then, as you can tell, we are back then into some of John's writings. So if you remember... The, th- uh, the theme of the John series, it's based upon a verse and a purpose statement that John gave us in his gospel. This should be familiar to you. It's John 20, verse 31, and I want to remind us of why John wrote his gospel. He said, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. John knew Jesus personally, intimately, and by the power of the Holy Spirit wrote down for us in the, now the gospel of John, that we may believe who Jesus is, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Christ, and understanding who He is listening to his teaching that we would believe in him. We would believe in his message. We believe that he is God's son and what that means. And by believing in him, we would have life in his name. Those are important and foundational truths. Now, John continued, obviously, following Christ and serving the church, the budding church, as an apostle. As time went on and the gospel was being known all throughout the region and literally going into the ends of the earth, he now wrote letters to these churches. And this was John's pastoral heart for this people of God that had been called out to follow and serve Jesus. And he wrote these three letters, again, right near the end, first and second, and third, John, to the church. And he tells us in 1 John why he was writing these letters. And this is what he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He said, I write these things in this letter to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So his first writing was to those who had not heard so that they would believe. And now he's writing to people who have believed to give them insurance that they have eternal life. This is important for us who believe or say that we believe as most of America says that they are Christians. These are questions, I would say diagnostic questions questions that we are to ask ourselves so that we would have assurance that we would know that we have eternal life. These are important, important questions. There are vital questions for each one of us as a person that we would test ourselves and see if indeed We are in the faith that we would not be self-deceived. Each one of us, this should help strengthen us and perhaps clarify to us and help convict us, so to speak, as we say, what is happening? What is in my heart? And do I truly believe? These, of course, are pastoral concerns. 
I've been a pastor for about 30 years, going plus, uh, 30 years plus. And I feel John's heart as I was rereading this passage this morning and rereading what I wrote down for this message this morning. I felt John because John had been with people for decades at this point. And he knows that over time that people say they believe and then as time goes on they walk away from Christ and they walk away from fellowship of the church. It is heartbreaking. I know people like that as well who have been a part of congregations that I've served and heard sermon after sermon really decades and years and years walking away or still believing in in things that are not accurate according to the Bible, are not true about Christ, and it is heartbreaking. And so these are good questions to ask ourselves as a congregation. These are good questions to diagnose um, in ourselves and consider when people say they believe. How do we know? John helps us in this book, gives us a series of, of questions to ask and examine. And again, I want you to be encouraged and have the peace of Christ. And I also, also want you to, to consider these things. What is happening inside of your soul? Because these <laughs> questions matter. And what we truly believe matters. Paul encourages us to do these things. We see this in 2 Corinthians, to examine ourselves, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. And these questions are the test questions. And we're just going to look at two of them this morning, and we'll look at more as we work through this book. But it is serious business. I've prayed a lot for this service. We pray for every service, that God would help us today, speak to us today, and most importantly, give us ears to listen to what He may be asking of us. So we're going to look at two questions. We're going to turn to the first question. And the question is, do you walk in the light? Do you walk in the light? And we're going to unpack that to understand what this means. Hopefully, hopefully clearly understand what that means and then ask yourself the question. So here we are, 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to read 5 through 7. We're going to stop and consider these things before we move to the second question. So here it is. This is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you. So this is John talking about what he'd received from him being Christ. He received this message and now is communicating this message to us. God is light. And we're going to unpack that. Okay? In him, in God, there is no darkness at all. Now, if we claim to have fellowship, relationship, know God, believe in Him, if we claim to have fellowship with Him, but yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, We do have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. So let's examine this and talk about this. So this first question of are we or do we walk in the light starts with God's nature, right? God is is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean, right? That God is light. So this declaration, this revelation that God is light is a penetrating description of the being 
and nature of God. It means that God is absolute in His glory, in His splendor. God is absolute in truth. God is absolute in holiness. He is the embodiment and source of glory, goodness. He is the source of truth. He is the source of purity, righteousness, holiness. The phrase, God is light, contains these things. John tells us plainly that God is light. He is absolute perfection. He is absolute holy. There's no darkness at all. There is no shade to God or speck in Him or stain or moral imperfection. In Him, there's no fault. There's no failure. There's no falsehood. In God, there's no deceit. No divination or dishonesty. This is why that we read in Scripture, as the angels are in God's presence, they always cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy is God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. This is why we read in Scripture, we come across passages as Isaiah beholds the Lord in His glory, says, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, coming from a people of unclean lips. This is why this apostle John, when he was alone in exile on an island called Patmos, when Jesus came to him in the vision and he saw him in his glory and he wrote the book of Revelation, when he saw the glorified Christ, he fell at his feet as though dead. I want us, and John wants us, and Jesus wants us, as he is the light, being a reflection of light. Right? He is the truth, being a reflection of truth. He is the glory of God being a reflection of the glory of God, the exact representation of God the Father. It is important for us to understand God's goodness, His truthfulness, and His glory. This is God. And so we say that we walk with God. John is saying that, listen, God is glorious beyond our comprehension. Perfect in all ways. And when we believe in Christ, our, and we'll get to this, our sins are forgiven. We are made righteous because the goodness of God demands the goodness of of humanity in order for us to walk in fellowship. That is unity. That is in relationship with one another. So John says, if you understand God and who He is, and you say that you now walk or in relationship with this person, then you walk in the light, or walk like Jesus. Granted, we don't do this perfectly, and John addresses that, but this is now the direction of our 
thoughts, the desire of our hearts, the movement that we are looking to follow, that we will walk like Jesus. So John is saying to his friends, he is saying to the church, saying to us, saying, if you say you have fellowship with God, you know God, you believe in Christ. God who is light, and yet you're saying you're walking with Him, but yet you're living or walking in the darkness, in hiding, in sin, in unrighteousness, in things that are not true or right or pleasing or noble. If you say the one thing, but your life actually evidences something else, you're deceived. And you're a liar. And I love how the NIV translates the Greek here. And you do not live out the truth. That's pretty stark. It is precious. It is an important question. If you've ever been to the doctor, and I hope you go to the doctor, right? If you come to them and you say, I have a really, really bad pain right over here, and the doctor says, Ah, eh, don't worry about it. Go home. Watch football. <laughs> Would that doctor be a good doctor? No. The doctor sees something or hears something, he'll start asking you questions. Does it hurt when I do this? What happens when you do that? You know what? We're going to have to run a couple tests. We need a sample of your blood. We need to perhaps put you in a machine that we can take a look so that we can understand what's going on. The doctor, being a good doctor, will ask you diagnostic questions to understand what's going on. John, being a good spiritual physician, says we need to talk about the spiritual condition of your soul. And so I'm going to ask you some diagnostic questions. The first one is, if you say you have fellowship with God, now you have to understand who God is. Are you striving to walk and be like Christ? And if you say one thing but yet are living another, if you say, oh, I'm fine, and yet you're not clearly fine, we have to talk about that. And so this is what John is doing for us, and this is what the Holy Spirit is even asking of us right now. To consider, are you walking along these things? Now, John continues in verse 7. He says, but, hey, hey, if we walk in the light, and this is good news, as he, Christ, is in the light, this is verse 7, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. This is incredibly good news for us. We can have peace with the God of all creation. We can walk with him. We can even be adopted into his family. This relationship is not established in our goodness and in our righteousness. It's established in the goodness and the righteousness of God himself. You should clap for that. Do 
you and I can't be good enough to walk with God. Can't. Jesus is the righteous one. And so when we come to him, we, we come to God in truth and, and, and recognizing um, God's glory. And just like Dionysia set us up so well this morning, we come into the light and then by the light we see all things, right? What light does is makes everything else visible. And then we look down to compare to God's glory and goodness and righteousness. And we look to our own life. We're like, woe is me. And in that distance and in that contrast, in steps Jesus, the mediator, the atoner, the one who satisfies the judgment against us because of our rebellion against the holiness and goodness and perfection of God. And once we believe in Christ, by His sacrifice we are made pure. So we have to ask ourselves this question. And some of you, and perhaps most of you, and I hope it's to be all of us, that we say, yes, I believe, right? You're here in church today. We prayed that you would be in church today. You're not here by accident today. There is a power called the Holy Spirit that is moving and calling us into relationship with Him and into the body of Christ. This being one of many expressions of that. How are we doing? What's happening? Right? Are and is our desire of our heart, the thoughts of of our mind becoming more convinced of the truth? Is the Holy Spirit continuing to convince us and convict us of things? And are we looking and following after Christ? Don't be deceived. <laughs> I wonder sometimes where there are surveys of Americans, and again, it's around the 86 percentile that people say that they're Christians. When I drive to church on Sunday morning, I don't have to fight traffic, okay? Right? I have no problem crossing Broadway. My house is on the south of that. I, sometimes when I'm sitting there at 5 o'clock, I sit there forever. I don't like sitting there forever, right? Why is it? Because everyone's going to work, right? Or coming home from work at that time. At, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock when I come into church on a Sunday, it takes me no time to get here. There's no traffic. And I'm both grateful for that, <laughs> for my own self, but I'm also incredibly sad about that. So if 86% of Americans say they're Christians, we don't have enough seats in churches to house 86% of our population. It's alarming to me sometimes where, you know, you watch these award programs, right? The Emmys or the Oscars or the Grammys or whatever. Here's my filth song. And when I get my award, I just thank God for his goodness. I believe in Jesus. Why then? You got like half naked women in your songs. Why then are you glorifying all these? What thing? Why is it that you're living large? Does that bother you? Yeah. What it does is it 
people think, oh, well, I can, you know, do anything I want and live any way I want, and I'm still good with God. <laughs> Sin's a problem. Why? Because God is holy and just and righteous, and you say that you know Him, but you don't walk like Him or in His light, then you really don't know Him. And you deceive yourself. This should be troubling to us, and this should be affirming to us. If you say, I'm all in, then we go after Him. So the first question, do you walk in the light? Now, John continues, and he asks us a second question. I put it together. Do you own and confess your sin? Right? So John starts out with the pure righteousness and goodness of God. Starts there. Talks about us walking in the light. And then he recognizes the reality of our lives that we are sinful people. And what about this? And he talks about Christ who purifies us. And then he goes on and he, he has, has us ask these questions. This is verse 8 of 1 John 1. Now, he says, if we claim to be without sin, which is like hard to fathom, but it's true that some people think, well, sin isn't an issue. You can do whatever you want with whomever you want, and you do whatever you want, and it's no problem. He says, wait a second. So if you claim to be without sin, <laughs> you and I, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's an astounding statement. And verse 9, and this is a precious verse. This is the gospel. Right? But this is the good news. If we confess our sins, own it, acknowledge it, bring it to the light. If we confess our sin because we want to walk with this righteous God, if we confess it to Him, not hide it, He, God, is faithful and He's just to forgive Give us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a good promise. But if we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. So to walk in the light means to become increasingly conscious, conscious of sin. The sin that would hinder our fellowship with God. And a, and a sin that hinders our fellowship with other people. And by the way, fellowship means, again, relationship. It's not knowing things about God or knowing things about people, but knowing God and knowing the person. Fellowship. Right? So walking the light means that these things happen. Walking the light and the sin is revealed not to run away into darkness again. Rather we bring it by faith to God whose son gave his life that our sins may be forgiven and re removed. You see this response in the book of Genesis. If you remember Adam and Eve in the garden, do you remember this? Okay, Genesis chapter 1, God made a perfect world, made us perfect without sin, and had relationship, fellowship, where God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Perfect harmony, perfect relationship. It says they were naked and unashamed, meaning that there was intimacy, there was no hiding. And yet when our spiritual and physical ancestors believed a lie about the nature of God, okay, you can't trust Him, He's holding out on you. We together, collectively, representatively, believed a lie 
and trespassed, did what God told us not to do. We did what we thought was good for us, but it was not good for us because we didn't trust God. You know what Adam and Eve did next? Hid. Covered themselves. We, reflectively, often do the same. When we know that by thought or action, we, hasn't, we haven't lived up to the glory of God, right? I'm in that category as well. We all are. Right? Reflectively, we want to pull back and pull away. Right? But God's invitation is to come to me. It's not like he doesn't know, right? Well, if I don't tell God, he'll never know. He knows. You're never going to tell him something that he's like, oh, I didn't know that, right? He already knows. And he invites you to relationship with him. He doesn't say, hey, 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 clean up and then come to me. He says, Come to me and I will clean you up. That helps us. It's the best thing that we can do. We know we ain't walking right or thinking right or living right. The best thing for us to do is run to Him. Come into the light versus slide away into further darkness versus hiding ourselves. Why would we want to run to him? Because he is faithful and just, and when we confess our sins, he will purify us from all unrighteousness. All sinfulness, right? That should be a good amen spot right there, by the way. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. So understanding how perfect God is, understanding how far we are than understanding how Jesus bridges that gap. It says, come to me and I will forgive you of your sin. Every sin, every time, right? This is incredible. So first thing we have to do, and first question, excuse me, second question, first, if you walk in the light, second Question, first part of the second question, do you own your sin? Acknowledge it. Do you pray like David? Lord, seek me. Seek my heart. Help me to see if there's any wicked way in me. That's a prayer God will answer. (laughs) Be it a slight thing or a big thing. And he tells us to come to him and confess it removing this barrier. Now, John talked about this uh, in the Gospel of John, right? I'm going to read a quick passage and we'll continue in this passage, but reminding us back to what John chapter 3 says. This was in a conversation with Nicodemus, one of the beloved, most beloved chapters in the entire Bible, where John 3 6, of course, is placed. After that conversation, John says to this religion, religious leader, this is the verdict, light is come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because why? Their deeds were evil, recognizing the glory and goodness of God. Now, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth lives by the truth about God, about themselves, about Christ and His righteousness, all of these people that come into the light. Why? So that may be seen plainly that what they have done, okay, coming to Christ, living in the light, has been done in the sight of God. This is the direction that God calls us into relationship with Him. We have to deal with the reality of his nature, and then we have to deal with the reality of our fallen nature. 
and then deal with what God has done in Christ to give us a new nature to follow after Him. So the good news is that if we are convicted of sin, and I hope you are when you sin, right? if you're not convicted of sin, you have a bigger problem. Your heart has become really callous and hard. Conviction, I often think about like the rumble strips on the side of the freeway. You guys know what I'm talking about? You go down 39 or go on 90, right? And on the side of the road, they have these strips of uneven pavement that if you kind of drift a little bit, kind of wakes you up, right? Huh, right? You're looking at your cell phone or falling asleep or whatever. They're there for your protection because if you keep going in that direction, you could hurt yourself badly or you could hurt somebody else. Conviction is like that as you are going down your journey of life. If you start to stray and you hear the rumble strip of your soul, right? That's for your benefit. Because if you keep going that direction, it's not going to be a good ending for you. You're going to get in a place that's not going to be helpful to you. Thank the Lord because of His goodness that gives us His Holy Spirit that brings His conviction to us to help us walk in the light. Say amen to that, right? God, thank you for that. And so sometimes people just see uh, 1 John chapter 1, 9 and say, well, if I confess my sin, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all righteousness, so I'm just going to keep on sinning because I can go back and come back every time, right? Just go to confession again, and it's all good. And next week, I'll just do it again. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a problem. And John says, yeah, yeah, I know how y'all are thinking. Yeah, I know what's going on, right? <laughs> and so he goes on, right, in verse, chapter 2, verse 1. That's why I included it in this passage, right? He says, now, my dear children, my dear children, right? <laughs> I write this to you so that you will not sin, right? See why he's doing this? I'm writing this so you won't sin. It's not good for you. But then he goes on, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. (laughs) He is the atoning sacrifice. Depending on your version, here's a big theological term. Propitiation, right? Atoning sacrifice. The one who paid your debt, okay? Jesus, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? So he's writing these things for us that we would own and confess our sins so that we can have forgiveness. And not that we can continue to sin, but that we would continue to walk in righteousness, And then he talks about why we can do this because of what Jesus did, the righteous one. There is only one righteous one, and it's not you. It's not me. It's Jesus the Christ, right? It's not any other religious figure as well. Buddha didn't die for your sin. Muhammad didn't die for your sin, the New Age gurus and all of these people and they follow my way. They didn't die for your sin. There's only one righteous one. All people can come to the Father through Jesus. That's the good news. But it is through Jesus. Jesus is not a way of many ways to come to the Father. Jesus is the way to come to the Father. Please understand this. And everyone has opportunity to come to God through Christ. He died for my sin, your sin, our sin. Me, take it personally. But also, it's available to all who come to Him. This is the good 
news. So we have opportunity and responsibility to examine ourselves. And today we go to the doctor, Jesus, and we say, hey, I'm here for a checkup. <laughs> right? This is a spiritual checkup. And if you say that you believe and you say, I am looking to walk as Jesus. And when I sin, which we all do by commission or omission, committing things or not doing the right things, right? Committing the wrong things or not doing the righteousness of God. We own those things. We come to our wonderful, perfect, loving Father through Jesus. We're forgiven relationship with Him, and we continue to walk. Are you living in the light? Are you owning and confessing the reality of our soul, and then coming to Jesus with it. Those who believe, those who have eternal life, this is what we do in spiritual health. And that's just two. We're going to please be reading this book, right? You're not like, oh, I can't believe that's in there. Just read it, okay? This is not like I'm keeping it to myself, right? Read it. And we're going to look at these things, other tests. These are important test. So I hope today two things are happening. I'll conclude with this and we're going to do communion. I hope that you have gotten confirmation that you are doing these things. I hope you're encouraged and you will continue to walk in this way. Understanding who God is. Understanding what Christ has done. Understanding. Do this to greater, greater degrees. Some of you hearing me, perhaps online or in this room, or 10 years from now, these things live in the internet. Right? Uh, you think, oh, yeah, I'm a believer. But then you look at this into the mirror of God's Word, and you look at yourself and like, hmm, wait a second. These are vital questions for the eternal state of your soul. Ask them. Perhaps you wake up today that you've been sleeping in the darkness and you thought you were dreaming of the light. You say, you know what? I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to follow this. I'm going to believe the truth. Or I'm going to continue to investigate. Please, please do so. So, Father, as we now transition into a time of communion and reflection and reaffirming um, our belief, kind of recognize that you are working in this room. God. God, thank you for these people people you love or hear. And God, I've done my best. Do the work, God, that no human can do. God, will you speak to us? Give us hearts that want to know the truth, God, and look at the reality of the things we talked about today. God, I pray 20 years from now, everyone here would either be in glory or continue to walk in the light. No one, the sound of this microphone, would drift in the darkness. God, those who are caught there, and we'll talk about this, God, 
Help us, God, to continue to move in your direction. Continue to go deeper in love with you. Continue to throw ourselves upon you. And God, help us to free from the sin that so easily entangles us. And ask for freedom for people today. So God, as we consider again going to communion, Lord, um, continue to do your work in our hearts, God, the hearts of those we love. Thank you for your calling us to come to you and equipping us to come to you. Thank you for the promise of new life and life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen.